Have you seen that God is good in your life? Thanks to the Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church for that. That's the church David Ashrick used to pastor in Australia. His son was, uh, one of his sons was in that choir there. Well, let's talk to our good God now as we prepare to open up his word. Heavenly Father, we are grateful, beyond grateful, when we survey the, the history of our lives and we think about how many times we've let you down, and yet every time you've been willing, excited to give us full forgiveness, full pardon, and your perfect spotless record instead of our stained record. You are so good. And so it is with gratitude uh, and eagerness that we open your word this morning to better understand you and your will and your story in the past and your story that impacts us today. So this is our prayer in Jesus' name. I enjoy getting my hair cut. I recently discovered a barber college in Riverbank. $5 haircuts. I've been bragging to you, <laughs> some of you. Now, there is a bit of a gamble. I mean, I, mean, I, I do enjoy rock climbing, and so a little bit of risk taking within a, a safe confines. And there are teachers that can help fix your hair if it gets messed up. But I went there a couple weeks ago about 10 days ago, and you never know who you're going to see or what you're going to encounter. But as I was leaving my car, I felt this impression that I needed to put more glow into my wallet. I've got this new wallet that I can actually put whole glow inside of, and so it doesn't get all mangled as I carry my wallet around. And I grabbed a specific track, and I put it in my wallet, and I went into the the business, and I got a haircut, and it was a newer student, so the, the haircut took longer, and, uh, but that's okay. We had a good conversation, and some point in our conversation, he mentioned that he listens to the Paranormal Podcast. Now, I, I don't listen to this. I've never listened to it, but you can just imagine the types of things that might be discussed on a Paranormal Podcast, para being alongside of, so here's normal, and then there's this stuff over here. You know, what is this stuff? And so towards the end of the conversation and the haircut, I said, hey, earlier you mentioned you listened to the Paranormal Podcast. And he said, oh, yeah, when I was a young boy, I had an experience. And I said, well, tell me about it. So he told me the story about when he was a young boy. Long story short, he saw a dark spirit figure in his grandmother's house. Freaked him out. Um, and ever since then, he's wondered, what was that? What happened to me when I was a young boy in my grandma's house? As we were concluding our conversation, and I, I kind of shared some stories with him to pique his interest a little bit. Uh, as we were concluding our conversation and the haircut was done, I said, well, let me give you something. I, I got a little pamphlet. In fact, I was leaving my car, and I felt impressed to put this pamphlet in my wallet, and I handed him the glow track that says, can dead people talk? And he said, wow, everything happens for a reason, doesn't it? And he said, next time you come back, I want to talk with you about this pamphlet. Uh, I don't share that to say, hey, look at me, look at what I did. I share that to say, God has divine appointments for us in our ordinary, everyday lives. And if we are willing to listen and prepare, we can be ready for those divine appointments. I had two other glow uh, tracks in my wallet, but they weren't the right topic for what this guy needed. Could it be everywhere around us, there are opportunities that God wants us to take advantage of? Uh, today, as we turn to the book of Acts, starting in chapter 8, verse 26, we're going to see a big-time divine appointment with Philip, the uh, kind of deacon, uh, but for sure evangelist. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. 
In Acts chapter 8, verse 26, and I'm reading today from the New King James Version. Whatever version you're reading from today is great. Acts chapter 8, verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. As you look at the writings of Luke, Luke in particular, of any uh, writer in the New Testament, uh, as far as writing stories, he seems to be the one who mentions angels the most. So if you like angel stories, read the book of Luke and read the book of Acts. It says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward where? South. And you might have a Bible that says um, midday or noon. That's because the word for south and midday or noon is the same word. Because in that part of the world, at noon, the sun is going to be in the southern hemisphere of the sky. The sun's going to be pointing south if it's noon. So it's really the same, the same words. But God was telling him through this angel, go south and go along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to what place? Gaza. You've heard of the Gaza Strip uh, in the news for, from year after year. Go down there towards Gaza. That's a, a historical place. A lot of different things happened at Gaza. Samson, he died and was humiliated in Gaza. Um, even in more recent history, Alexander the Great, it took him five months to finally capture Gaza, but he wanted it for a military fortress in his own campaigns. Uh, Gaza, important city, one of five major ones of the Philistines back in the time of David. But after Gaza, it says, it adds a little bit. It says, this is desert. Um, the road towards Gaza from Jerusalem was not that well-traveled. Uh, there were fewer people on that road. And if you continue on from Gaza, you're just going out into the desert. There's nothing there. Uh, you're heading towards Egypt, but it's desolate, barren desert. Now, Philip, if you remember from last week, he had just conducted a very successful evangelistic series. They baptized a whole bunch of people, men, women, uh, people uh, of different backgrounds, baptized uh, and then there was the story of Simon, who, who was trying to buy the Holy Spirit and so forth. So it's a very odd time for God to tell him, hey, you know what, I want you to leave. Things are going well, but I've got an appointment for you somewhere else. Sometimes God's appointments for us, they seem odd. They seem not what you would expect. My dad was driving out of our driveway, growing well, the house I, I grew up in, and he felt this impression from the Holy Spirit saying, turn right. It makes absolutely no sense to turn right because we lived on a dead-end street. If you turn right, you're going to hit the dead end. Right? Turn right. <laughs> you know, what if the neighbors see me? This will be foolish. Turn right. So he turns right. There's only a few more houses down that street. He goes down to the, towards the end of the street and he sees Jim Pemberton out in his yard. He'd been mowing his lawn. Ah, God, you want me to talk to Jim? So he gets out of his car, and he talks with him. And it was obvious that this was a divine appointment. Jim was beyond frustrated with life, and he needed someone, and he needed someone then. And my dad followed that prompting. Maybe you've had similar promptings. God's instructions for us to get to the divine appointments he wants us to reach, they don't always make sense. But it always is worth it when you follow. So God said to Philip through the angel, leave. Go on that deserted road that few people travel. Go towards the desert. Verse 27, so he arose and went. Unlike Jonah, who wrestled and went the opposite direction, didn't want to go. Jonah didn't do that, but Philip says, okay, God, I'll go. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He met somebody on the road, somebody important. The guy was from, from what region? Ethiopia. 
Uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, this was a place called Cush. This was the place that the Queen of Sheba had come from to visit Solomon. And she had come to know and respect and, and seemingly to worship the God uh, of Solomon from her encounter. In fact, some wonder if maybe even that faith that she accepted may have trickled down to eventually this man coming from that same region. But he was from Ethiopia, which was larger than modern-day Ethiopia and included parts of Sudan and over to the Red Sea, and it was south of, of Egypt. And it says he's a eunuch. Um, he was serving there in the, in, in the government, and as often as the case, um, they did a procedure, and so he wasn't having kids, right? His voice may have been a little bit higher also. Uh, so he is there, uh, a man, but he was given, the Bible says, great authority. And he, was, he had this authority under Candace. Now that's not a name, that's actually a title, like the name or the title Pharaoh uh, for Ethiopia, Candace was the name of the ruler. So she was uh, ruling the nation. You talk about girl power, Ethiopia, back in the day, they had a lot of girl power. In fact, in 325 or thereabouts, the church historian Eusebius wrote about Ethiopia and said it was still ruled by women monarchs, by queens. So he was there serving the queen, and he was in charge of what department, as you look at verse 27? The treasury. Now this is very interesting because where was Philip heading towards? From Jerusalem to what town? Gaza, that's right. And in Greek, the word for treasury that's used here is guess what word? Gaza. Uh, so Philip is coming, uh, he's heading towards Gaza. He meets a man who's in charge of the Gaza. And in this witnessing divine opportunity, He's going to tell him about the ultimate Gaza, which is Jesus. So he's, he's on the road, and then he realizes why God had him on that road. It was to meet this important official from Ethiopia. Now, why was the uh, official in that part of the world to begin with? What does verse 27 tell us? That's right. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, this man apparently is a Jew. He, he seems to be a convert to Judaism, and he had gone to the place, the, the holiest place in that religion, to worship. And now he's returning, verse 28. And returning, sitting in his what? Chariot. Now, when I would read this, I pictured the kinds of chariots you see in Charleston Heston's Ten Commandments, you know, the ones that the Pharaoh would stand in, and, and the battle chariots. That's not the kind of chariot he was, he was in. Notice what posture he was, he was taking. He was sitting down. This is more like a carriage, uh, a type of carriage, not like the carriages we have today. He is taking a ride back to Ethiopia, and perhaps it was drawn by an ox, pulled by an ox. So this is moving slowly, and while he is moving along, it says he's doing something. He was reading where or what? Isaiah the prophet. Probably this man had purchased a scroll on his trip to Jerusalem. Uh, he's wealthy enough to possess a scroll. He buys one and he's reading it. And being that he's a eunuch, this is an especially good book of the Bible for him to read because there were restrictions for eunuchs in regards to uh, some of the, the places where they could worship and so forth. But the book of Isaiah uh, talks directly to those who had suffered this fate and says, hey, you're welcome in God's house of worship. You're welcome. Everybody has an offspring, a heritage, a reward. Everybody has a place in the heavenly kingdom, regardless of whether you may be physically uh, without blemish or, or may be... Um, otherwise, so to speak. So he's reading the book of Isaiah. In verse 29, it says, The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. Uh, there probably were a number of people who were in this caravan going along, and it's not moving very fast, so it wouldn't be that hard for Philip to do that. 
And so the Bible says in verse 30, so Philip ran to him. Again, immediate obedience to the, to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what we want and need in our own lives? Not, well, let me think about it, God, and I'll get back to you. Let me sit here and think about it. Meanwhile, he misses his opportunity. Uh, sometimes opportunity only knocks once when it comes to divine appointments. Uh, we have to be ready. Decided in our heart already, we're going to obey when God says to go or to stay. So he ran to him, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. In those days, it was very common to read out loud. He's reading, and so he asks him a question. Do you understand what you're reading? Now, he's actually reading here from the Septuagint, or from the Greek translation of, of that, and it becomes obvious from the language uh, that follows in verse 32 and verse 33. Do you understand it? Not do you comprehend the words, but do you understand the meaning of what you're reading? And the guy says in verse 31, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asks Philip to come up and sit with him. Now Philip is riding along in the carriage and the chariot. Verse 32, the place in the scripture which he read was this. The Bible says, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Does anybody know what chapter in Isaiah this is from? That's right. It's Isaiah 53. This is verse 7 and verse 8. So this is uh, really, really awesome. Uh, and by the way, there's a little play on words in, in the Greek in that question. Do you know, do you understand what you're reading? Uh, it, it's, do you understand, gnoskes, what you are reading, anagonoskes. Uh, I don't know if the Ethiopian eunuch appreciated plays on words, but nevertheless, it's there for us uh, in the Greek. So, uh, but it's very significant. Notice the place where he's reading. What is this passage about? Who is it talking about? It's talking about Jesus. So can you imagine the precision that, the, that had to happen here to line all this up? It's a long journey from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, but Philip met him at the right spot on the road. He met him at the right time on the road while he's reading the right verses. He could have met him when he was reading in chapter 16 or 18, or it would have been a very different experience, but he met him at exactly the right time. You know, sometimes they say, as my dad told me, a miracle is an ordinary event with precise timing. This divine appointment was, was an ordinary event, but it had precise timing. Just when he's reading this chapter that is steeped in language about Jesus as Messiah, Philip approaches him and says, do you understand? And he's like, how can I? Unless someone teaches me. Verse 34, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Now this is actually a very intelligent question. This shows that he already had some knowledge because there was debate in that day is this the prophet speaking about his own suffering? Is this, the, is this the nation of Israel that is suffering and going through suffering? Uh, or a third possibility, which he didn't mention, is this the Messiah suffering? Which was the least popular option as I understand it, because who wants a Messiah that suffers? You want a Messiah that's going to conquer in that line of thinking. So he was aware, and he was wondering, who is it? And Philip, he couldn't have asked for a better setup, right? It's like when somebody says just the right thing and you've got one of those punchlines or one of those jokes or just the exact thing you want to say. It was just perfect. And he, he, he starts into a Bible study. Verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Much like the, the people on the road to Emmaus, we're walking along, talking about things, and Jesus, without them knowing it, walks along. 
uh, and he opens up the scriptures to them. Philip, who was aware of these scriptures, starts giving the same kind of Bible study. And the man from Ethiopia, this eunuch, he realizes Jesus is the Christ. Now, as they went along, verse 36, down the road, they came to some water. Again, another ordinary event, but with precise timing. They've sufficiently convinced the man that that Jesus is the Christ. And then, oh, here's some water. And the man says, see, here's some water. What hinders me from being baptized? What would prevent me from being baptized? Verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, Probably verse 37 is not in Luke's original account of the book of Acts. It seems to be added later by a scribe. Uh, But that shouldn't trouble us. The concept is taught elsewhere in Scripture. Um, But obviously this man did believe in Jesus and had come to accept him in all his heart. And so they went forward uh, and proceeded with the baptism. Verse 38 says, So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Notice here, they go down into the water. Verse 39 says, and now when they had come up out of the water. This illustrates the type of baptism that the early Christian church used. They did full immersion, which is why we have a baptistry with full immersion. And we even have one out there. Um, I haven't got to use the outside one since I've been here. So if one of you wants to be baptized outside there, we'll do it. But we can also use the warm one too. Uh, There's a flat kind of green section that where we remove the cover. Is it warm out there too? Well, that shows my ignorance. Yeah, we can do a warm one out there too, apparently, I'm being told. Now, some, some ha- will, will notice this is a pretty quick transition. He's just met the guy, and now he's baptizing him a short period later. Some have, have gone on to suggest that, that rapid baptism is is what's being taught. Uh, Immediate baptism based upon when someone receives Jesus. They say that's what the New Testament teaches. Uh, I think a careful understanding will show that that that's not not the case. There are at least five specific examples of rapid baptism where somebody's baptized quickly. But in most of them, you can see that there's already a foundation that has been laid previously. Uh, With this guy from Ethiopia, He's coming to worship the true God in Jerusalem. He apparently is already a Jew, which means he already has access to the the Torah, to the scriptures, to the teachings of God. And and he seems to be a devout guy who wants to follow them um, in his heart and in his life. He's got an active Bible study life already, as we've seen. Uh, He's going down the road, reading his Bible. Uh, Thankfully... Uh, there wasn't much danger in that. But I did have a principal in high school who, who would drive and read at the same time, which is uh, really, really dangerous. So this guy already had uh, the fundamentals in his life. Now, it is true. Sometimes it's very appropriate to baptize someone quickly. Other times, uh, a, a longer process needs to take place. Uh, but for Philip, this was the right time So he baptized him, and then notice what happens after the baptism. It says, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. I was doing some thinking on this phrase. What would that look like? I mean, imagine you're the one that's baptized. You go under the water, you come up, and then all of a sudden, the guy that baptized you and gave you Bible studies is gone, or he's flying away. I don't know. Did he disappear? Or was he like physically carried through the air? The scripture doesn't tell us. Um, Jesus would sometimes just appear and then disappear. uh, So we know that's possible. But Elijah was carried in a chariot of fire. In any case, Philip goes away. The eunuch saw him no more. And it says the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. This man had found the pearl of great price, 
the treasure above all treasures, the Gaza that was most important, and he was going back to his home country. Uh, church tradition tells us that he went back, not simply as a treasurer, but as a missionary. He had a mission to tell. And you know what's interesting? In Ethiopia, you can, uh, I've met Ethiopian Christians today uh, who still regard the Sabbath as God's day to be kept holy. Uh, the early Christian church took roots very early on in, in Ethiopia. Uh, in fact, before Paul ever went to Europe, the gospel was already going to Africa. Uh, and history or the stories tell us that this man was at least a part of that spreading of the good news. And then verse 40, our last verse for the day, but Philip was found at Azotus, which is several miles away. Uh, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. We're going to catch up with Philip later on in the book of Acts. But we'll see that he has established the center of evangelism there in Caesarea, uh, which becomes a very important place uh, for the early Christian church. So we see very clearly here, this story is a story all about one divine appointment after another. Divine timing after divine timing. And it closes uh, with Philip continuing going on his way to spread the word. As we said earlier, a miracle is often just an ordinary event with precise timing. Let me ask you this. Do you want to experience more miracles in your life? Do you want to be a part of more miracles in your life and the life of others? It is so fun when you can look back and say, wow, God really used me. It was a simple thing I did, but wow, that's really cool. God used me. So as we close this morning, I just wonder, who in your week ahead of you is waiting for the divine appointment God has for you? Maybe it's somebody that you know that needs a call or a visit to encourage them. Uh, a card, a letter, a text, a phone call, in-person visit. Maybe it's somebody you don't know or you kind of know that needs something. I'm sure thankful I had that glow track with me. Uh, I don't think every divine appointment needs to involve glow, but it sure helps. When you have a good conversation with someone that you know you have something you can leave with them at the end of the conversation. If you want to be ready for this appointment, think about what preparation you need to do to be ready for that moment. For some of you, in a very practical way, it'll be getting some glow as you leave, uh, or getting some primary treasures for the kids in your neighborhood, uh, or we have a bunch of extra uh, junior guides that are in the youth chapel that we can share. Um, preparing our hearts, putting scriptures in our mind, getting other resources, and then praying in your own heart day by day, saying, God, please give me an opportunity today to make a difference for you. Sometimes God will bring the person to you, and other times, like Philip, he's going to send you to them. But if you're willing, things will happen. You will be blessed, and others will be blessed too. I want to see who God has for me this week. How about you? And, and, and tell me. Next week, I want to hear the stories, all right? Text me during the week. Call me up. Let me know what happens. Uh, and maybe we'll have some stories next week to share. How fun. Let's pray. Dear God, we don't want to just be um, observing uh, the gospel going forward. We want to be a part of it. Big or small, Lord, use us in some way. All of us are alive, and that tells me that all of us can do something. So, Father, in our own unique way, use us this week. Help us to look for these opportunities and prepare for them. And we'll rejoice in seeing how you will use broken vessels like us to participate in this great and awesome work. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen, amen and Amen. God bless you, have a happy Sabbath, and go out.
as God's missionaries this week.